Good evening. What you're about to witness may be one of the most horrendous acts of videography to emerge from a home shop machinist's lair. This is the journey into the deep, dark corners of an amateur watchmaker's psyche, and once you emerge, you will not be the same. I cannot answer the why or the purpose or the how, only tell you that what proceeds may be the result of a man who possesses far too many lathes and not enough milling machines. May that be a warning for all of us. Is there hope for this man? The damage is done. On with the show. Oh, the horror. The horror. As a cold, unfeeling rain pours from the soulless, black New England night, we find our protagonist contentedly catching up on his backlog of unwatched This Old Tony videos. Little does he know what's in store. Our mothers-in-law shop at the same shoe store. We both started Patreon accounts last year. We both feel exactly the same way about lathes. You know, I think Demosthenes put it best when he said, For whatever a man's actions are, such must be his spirit. So I'm going to finish this in the lathe. Get a room, you three. Seriously? Something's not right. I kind of feel like I'm losing my mind. <laughs> yes, the fibers of sanity, frail as gossamer strands, yield to madness. It feels more like I'm talking to myself now than when I talk to my hands. Hey, welcome back to the sh- <coughs> Hey everyone, welcome to the shop. Today we're going to make another one of these draw tubes. This is a little draw tube for the watchmaker's lathe to take the Webster Whitcomb style collets. The metric, I believe they're referred to as B8 collets, and the Webster Whitcomb collets are largely interchangeable except that the thread pitch that engages with the draw tube is 0.275 by 40 threads per inch for Webster Whitcomb and the B8 I believe it's M7. This draw tube is one I just made from plans that I have posted on my Patreon page. If you head over there you'll find plans for these little draw tubes and various other things but I need a second one of these. The little watchmaker's lathe takes the same collets in the tailstock as it does the headstock. So it makes sense to have a pair of these for those occasions when I need to use a Webster Whitcomb fitting in both the headstock and the tailstock. This bag of stuff here, we'll get to that a little later. I have a lot of this inch and a half diameter 416 stainless hanging around, so it seemed like the obvious material to use for starting this project. These will be the main portion of the draw tubes, the actual tube with a flange on the end that secures the handle. If I had to order materials specifically for this project, I'm honestly not sure what I would have gone with. 
1144 stress proof is always a tempting option, but it's not the cheapest. And 416 stainless, you can usually find some pretty good deals on it. That being said, it doesn't particularly need to be stainless for any reason. Any mild steel would work just fine. Even if I had ended up using some sort of tool steel like O1 or A2, or some sort of high carbon steel, I don't think I would have bothered heat treating it at all. Of course, tailstock support is pretty important here, but we'll come back to that in a moment. The outside turning in this setup will form two diameters. Most of the length will be a small enough diameter to be a comfortable fit within the lathe spindle and tailstock ram, as well as clear the pin that fits into the collet keyways. Toward the handle ends of the draw tubes is the register diameter. This short section is a much closer fit within the spindle of the lathe and the tailstock ram. Alright, I lied. There are another couple of diameters turned in this setup. One is the mounting hub for the handle, and the other is a shoulder just ahead of the handle mounting hub. This is the shoulder that bears against the end of the lathe spindle as the collet is tightened by the draw tube. With the outside diameters roughed in, the tailstock support was removed, and I began the process of step drilling through the tube from one end, starting with a good sharp screw machine length twist drill. The final hole size needed to be correct for tapping 0.275 inch by 40 threads per inch. Finally, the drilled hole was chamfered with a center drill to allow a bit of support for the tailstock center for finish turning the outside diameters. This is a 0.275 by 40 threads per inch tap that I purchased along with a matching die from a seller specializing in watchmaking tools. This oddball thread is found on a great many watchmaking lathes and accessories. After tapping, the chamfer was cleaned up with a center drill to ensure the center was not thrown off by burrs raised from the thread tapping. Finish turning with the tailstock center in place presented a challenge, not only with tool clearance, but also with such a thin wall section of the tube. At a certain point, every pass removed a portion of the bearing surface used for tailstock support. After taking the tube diameter down as far as reasonably possible with this tool, I took the register diameter and hub diameter to final size, then switched to a different tool with a broad, flat face for bringing the tube diameter to final size. The final pass was made cutting away from the headstock, and the tailstock support removed as the cut approached the end, to allow the tool to run off the end of the tube. This tool used for finishing couldn't quite get up to the register diameter due to chuck jaw interference with the tool post, 
So this portion of the diameter was touched up after switching back to the right hand turning tool. The bulk of the barely measurable bell shape left on the end of the tube from removing the tailstock support was removed with a file. The remainder will be dealt with later. Before removing the work, the register and hub were polished. The work is now reversed and held in a collet to turn the portion of the tube that runs through the handle and to turn the hub to the correct thickness. Following that, the through drilling is completed by drilling from this side. Concentricity of the through hole on this end of the tube is not important. The handle retaining plate is next and it starts from some brass sheet that is sawn square. The edges and center are roughly marked out using a pair of calipers, then we head over to the band saw. Sure, the lathe might be the king of machine tools, but this inexpensive band saw has got to be the most used machine tool in my shop. I used a superglue arbor to hold the square of sheet in place for turning the outer diameter. A tailstock center was used to keep the work pushed into place while the glue set, and I left it in place while turning as well. It probably didn't help much, but it felt like the thing to do. I've probably mentioned this before, but be careful of cutting pressure and heat when using a superglue chuck. Make sure your tool is good and sharp, and don't let much heat build up in the work. It doesn't take much to soften the superglue. Once turned to the correct diameter, the retaining plate blank is transferred to a step collet for drilling and boring the center to size. For the handle, I'm using a scrap chunk of some mystery wood that I thought looked nice. I'm no good with this stuff, but the consensus on the Home Shop Machinist forum was that it's Luan, apparently also known as Philippine Mahogany. I see manual machines, a lathe, and wood. Three strikes, you're out of here. To start with, this makeshift fence setup on the bandsaw made it easy to whack out a small slab to use for a blank. 
The blank was then sawed square. This hunk of wood has been hanging around in a box for years, so I was real happy for the excuse to use it for anything in spite of the waste. I'll be turning the OD with the blank held on a threaded arbor, so the center was drilled out to size before turning, and I made up a makeshift threaded arbor of the same diameter as the mounting surface on the draw tube. First though, I used a quick eyeballed setup in the four jaw chuck to face each side of the blank and bring it to thickness. Now, mounted on the arbor, the OD can be turned. And with the OD turned, the handle is finally transferred to a large step collet for boring the recesses in each side to accommodate the mounting hub and the retaining plate. Robin, Stefan, Tom, if you guys even made it this far, I suggest you avert your eyes at this point. Remember that slight taper at the threaded end of the draw tube that I mentioned earlier? It really doesn't matter, but I had been wanting to try some OD lapping, and this seemed like a good excuse to try it out and see how well I could get it to work, to get a consistent diameter for the length of the tube. I made this lap hastily from aluminum, and the only convenient abrasive I had on hand other than really fine polishing compounds was valve lapping compound. If I had it to do all over again, I would make the lap thicker, wider. It took quite a few passes to even out the diameter, but really didn't take very much time and I was real happy with the end result. The consistency in diameter was good enough that I couldn't measure a difference with my micrometers, and the abrasive seemed to crush down pretty quickly, so the finish was a lot finer than I originally thought it would be. So I've got the dividing head set up in the middle in a vertical orientation to drill the three screw holes through all these components to keep them held together. And I have a little bit of an issue figuring out how to retain them together so that 
those three holes can be drilled through all pieces simultaneously. Three millimeter clearance holes through the brass retaining plate and the wooden handle. And then smaller holes to be tapped through the tube itself here. What I decided to do is make a special clamping fixture comprised of some threaded rod, a nut, and the clamp itself. The clamp is relieved between the outside edges and the boss that centers it in the part here. So even though the tube might be a little bit proud of the retaining plate, it should still clamp everything together. Clearing the little bit of the tube here and clamping down just around the outside edges of the retaining plate. The little nut also has a little bit of a register on the bottom just to keep things from getting too cattywumpus. If I end up using this a lot, I'll probably lock tight the uh, threaded rod to the clamping part here. But for now this works pretty well. You can snug things up pretty well. I think that will hold just fine for these small drilling operations. Let's go see how it works. Here you can see the brick dividing head on the mini mill in the vertical orientation with an adjust true three jaw chuck installed. I don't think I've shown this dividing head on video yet. It's a good size for the mini mill, but this vertical orientation, especially with the chuck installed, there's just not much room left for tooling and z-axis travel. You can see here I'm using bespoke drill bit holders held in collets for the drilling operations. There was just nowhere near enough room for the Jacobs chuck with this setup. The dividing head spindle was indicated into the axis of the mill spindle. Then once the draw tube body was chucked, the chuck's adjustment was tweaked a bit to bring the part itself into the spindle axis. From there, the mill table was set over by the radius of the whole circle. The first drilling operation passes through all three parts, the retaining plate, handle, and mounting hub, and is the diameter for tapping the threads into the mounting hub. The second drilling operation is clearance diameter for the threads through the retaining plate and the handle. The handle being wood, it was very easy to feel the correct stopping point while drilling. The third operation is countersinking the holes in the retaining plate using my shop made countersink cutter. It was made specifically for this operation and has an integral depth stop. Unfortunately I made the slots in the drilling fixture a bit too narrow to accommodate this cutter, but with such small cutting forces and with the operation requiring some delicacy, it's not a big deal to hold the work in place with my finger. From this camera angle, the clearance between my finger and mill spindle is deceptive. It isn't nearly as close as it looks here.
I would have liked to leave the work setup in the dividing head for tapping the holes, but with this setup there just isn't enough room to get a small tap in there. For this reason I moved the work over to a bench vise with some rubber soft jaws for tapping the holes. I apologize for the poor lighting where the vise is mounted. The last components to make are the screws. I chose O1 drill rod mostly because I had some in a convenient diameter and it takes a nice finish. For this project I won't be heat treating the screws. The shoulder of the screw is turned to 3mm diameter and the portion to be threaded is turned down just a bit further to about 2.9mm. The length of the screws from the tip to the underside of the head needs to be pretty close across all of them, so that where the tips come through the backside of the mounting hub, they don't look uneven to the eye. What I'm doing here is using a dial indicator against the lathe carriage, set to zero at the tip of the screw, to turn the underside of the screw head the correct distance from the tip. Here are the screw embryos after being hacksawed off from the stock. Unfortunately my M3 die situation is pretty grim. I have two. One is a cheap import that's so terrible it just reduces the diameter instead of cutting threads. The other is from one of those craftsman sets with hex shaped dies that seem to be best suited for thread chasing rather than cutting new threads. I fumbled through it, but can't bring myself to show it on video. Instead, here is a reenactment that will serve to be much more educational. The heads were reduced to the correct thickness by facing. Then the tips were rounded over and polished. And then the heads polished.
Here are the screws ready to be slotted. If you've been around my shop a while, you'll know that I love using the 5NS Horth lathe with milling attachment for slotting screws. It's easy to set up and has that clever combination screw and lever feed. The lever feed is great for repetitive operations, making the whole thing a breeze. A properly made slotted screw should have its slots lightly chamfered to help avoid damage from screwdriver tips that are either the wrong size or flat ground instead of hollow ground. It only takes a few moments with a decent file, just make sure the file has safe edges and that it's straight rather than tapered. Because I value the appearance of these screws, I'm taking a bit of extra care and also using two different files. First is a fine double cut file, followed by a pivot file. If you're new to the channel, Google pivot files. They are often used by watchmaking folks, but would be useful to anyone doing small work with fine finish quality. These screws aren't for a watch, so no need for a black polish, or even to remove the tool marks from facing. These will do just fine. <laughs> yes. <coughs> Man, what is that stuff? Stalt, my dude, you sure know how to wear out a welcome. For finishing the retaining plate, I had first decided just to clean up the surface a bit on a fine abrasive stone. I wasn't even going to mention finishing of this part in the video, but I really wasn't happy with the appearance and decided to polish it with rotten stone, a substance probably familiar to some woodworkers, but also traditionally used by clockmakers for finishing brass. Rotten stone is a very fine dust that, when mixed with some light oil, forms a mild abrasive paste. I stopped when the surface of the retaining plate appeared to be a nice, fine, even matte finish, but now looking at this video footage I see some fine scratches remaining that I hadn't noticed. The last component to be finished is the wood handle. It's finished in place, installed on the draw tube, with the draw tube held in a collet. The shape is roughed in with a couple of cuts using the compound slide, then brought into final shape by using some coarse sandpaper. I used a few coats of boiled linseed oil as a finish. Let's try these puppies out. First things first, let's get this machine set up for some hand turning. We've got some 5mm stainless steel here. Let's try turning some of it. My 5mm collet is a Webster Whitcomb 
made by Sterrett. And let's pretend we need some tailstock support just so we can have something in the tailstock end. I'm not actually going to use that, it's just going to hang out here. Let's uh, bring you in closer so you can see what's going on. Now Hardings, now Romfu, now Deckle and Myford, on Linley, on Shoblin, on Monarch and Boxford. To the Deckle flown, to the Sharpening Stone, no need to dress the CBN cone. I got the cigarettes, I'm back from the corner store! Feels more like I'm talking to myself now than when I talk to my hands. <gasps> What's wrong, baby? I just had the weirdest dream.